Hey guys, my name is Evan, and I'm the co-author of this book, Get Backed, and I'm honored to be with you guys today here at Harvard Business Press in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They asked me, they said, this is a little bit of an MVP thing, but would you come on board and have a conversation with our viewers about some of the things you learned from the book, Get Backed. All right, well, what is this book even about? Well, the subtitle says, Craft your story, build the perfect pitch deck, and launch the venture of your dreams. Well, who am I and why am I remotely credible to talk about this? Well, I had the privilege after going to business school here at Harvard of launching two separate companies. And I want to tell you about them and I can do so briefly and a little bit humbly. This was our first one. This is this crazy idea to actually create an alternative to the United States Postal Service. Now, that sounds like a cool and crazy idea, but this was a headline that ran two years into that adventure. Terrible idea punished with death. Well, I hope you don't encourage or encounter that fate. The new venture we launched is this one, ABLE. And we're now the lowest cost online lender in the nation, and Forbes said, ABLE is capitalism at its best. So just wanted to tell you, I've loved getting to build companies and raise money on my own. Just as a reminder to the audience, we're here with Facebook Live at Harvard Business Press, and we'd love for you to ask some questions. Just post your questions in the comment feed. I'm going to run through some 10 lessons that we learned, and at the end, we'll turn to your questions. So please, ask away. We will certainly get to those questions as soon as we run through some basic points. Now, where did the book come from? This is the book that we wrote called Get Back. Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank said some nice things about us. And the point of the book was to really say there's a standard approach to building a great pitch deck, a set of slides that help you articulate your business in a way that you get investor capital. The second part of the book is actually walking people through a funnel process of saying, how do you identify investors, drive them all the way through to closing them? We believe that being an entrepreneur, having the grit and perseverance to stay with your business is the hard part. And we think raising capital might really should be the easy part. It is certainly teachable. Okay, so what have we learned? Let me run through some lessons with you guys. Here we go. 10 things we'll cover briefly. First, what am I even doing here? What is fundraising? A quick story. So my co-author of this book was 18 months into his roadshow trying to raise capital for a business that would be the Whole Foods version of Home Depot. His friends surrounded him and said, listen, your marriage is falling apart. You're just killing yourself. You've got to throw in the towel on this. He sent an email out to all the people that had been supporting him saying, I'm canceling it. This is just too burdensome. What happened? An investor wrote him and said, had you just told me you needed it, I'd give it to you. Here's $5 million. Well, I tell you that story to say that raising capital for your business is really hard. It takes a lot of perseverance and a real understanding of what the funnel looks like. How many people do you have to pitch to be likely to close your round? The average equity financing deal takes about six months to get funded. So as you think about your six months coming up of running your business, do you have the time to commit to it? probably doesn't mean abandoning actually running your business on a day-to-day -day basis, but it certainly means some pretty serious focus. So first of all, what are you doing? What are you getting into? Be ready for a pretty aggressive, intense run in front of you. Just as a reminder to everyone, we love hearing your questions. I'm Evan Baer, co-author of Get Backed. This is our book here, written by uh, myself and a co-author from Harvard Business Press. In this book, we walk you through how to create what we think is the ultimate pitch deck and the second half of the book is how to use that pitch deck, that set of slides, to go raise capital for your business. We're running through some 10 lessons learned of both my own companies as well as interviews with dozens of founders. Okay, number two, let's talk about the kind of capital that you might want to raise. So on the liability side of the balance sheet, you have debt and equity as options. Now, as an early stage company, it can be hard to access debt. Now, my company had as its hope to deliver debt options for earlier stage businesses. So if you think debt could be an option for you, you can check out ablelending.com, and we have some helpful calculators that walks through when can you qualify for debt. Now, most early stage companies really only have equity sale as the option for how they get financed. This is a helpful chart just walking through, okay, what stage of business am I in now and how much money do you need? And you see moving up and to the right here, you begin with accelerators, crowdfunding, friends and family, angel investors, angel groups, and eventually venture capital. Those are the pools of capital that you could be pitching when you're trying to sell equity as part of your business. 
So before you set out on any sales campaign, in this case a sales campaign to get your company funded, you have to decide what are you asking for, and that's the debt versus equity challenge. Okay, who to ask? Where are you going to go to ask for money? Now, people often say to me, Evan, if I just knew the people that you know, it would be easy for me to raise money. Well, first of all, for a long time, I didn't know those people. Rather, I consciously went out and tried to find people that could be helpful to my venture now and even in the future. Two tools I'll suggest to you now. I'll write them up on the board so you have them. One is CB Insights, and the other is AngelList. Now, many of you may know AngelList, and AngelList is actually angel.co. Many of you may know AngelList as a crowdfunding platform, which it is, but it's also a great way to identify investors. You want to be thinking about, has this investor invested in my sector before? Have they invested in my city before? Have they put money into my stage of company, so a seed stage or a series A stage? And have they written a check recently? Mike Maples has a great advice to founders to say, before you go pitch anyone that you think has money, make sure you know if they are actively writing checks right now. That will be a huge determinant of whether they're likely to write you a check. So build out a long list. I'd encourage at least 100 prospects on that list before you actually start the campaign itself. Now, just as a reminder, we love your questions. We'll be turning to those at the end of the conversation today. And thank you to those who are just tuning in. I'm Evan Baer, co-author of Get Backed, and we're walking through some deck and fundraising strategies to help you and your business get funded faster with the right kind of capital. So we've just run through a few things. What are you doing with the business? What kind of capital do you need? Who are you going to ask for money? Next is, what are you going to ask for in terms of how much money are you raising and what's the valuation? Well, let me give you a little insider tip here. This is a great counsel from Mike Maples, legendary Harvard graduate and then seed investor on Twitter. Mike says, you take the total fund size. If I could get an eraser possibly, guys. If you take the total fund size, let's say it's a, uh, oh, it's amazing. It's right here. We call this the MVP. Thanks for playing along with us. All right. So what does Mike have to say? Mike says you take the total fund size. Let's say it's $100 million. You know that the average fund is going to put money into 25 companies, but hold about the same reservation for each of those companies. So you take the total fund size, and you actually divide it by 50. So this means that when you are pitching a $100 million venture capital firm, you ask for $2 million. So that's how much you ask for. Now, what's your valuation? Oh, you simply multiply by 5. Okay, so you multiply by 5, and you get $10 million. Now, let's say you walk out of Floodgate Capital in Palo Alto and you go down the street to Andreessen Horowitz or Sequoia or any of these funds with billion-dollar funds under management. So what happens once you go to a billion-dollar fund? You divide by 50, writing the math straight down would be to say you raise $20 million and then your valuation is $100 million. Now, though romantic walks in Palo Alto can be great for your business, it probably doesn't 10x the value of your business. So there's something cheeky in this advice, which is to not take it literally. But the idea here is that in a lot of early stage financings, you need to remember that there are multiples and norms that are common in the industry today that are a lot different than what standard corporate America or even many MBAs learn. Things like multiple or comp analysis or discounted cash flow analysis really play little role in determining valuations of early stage businesses. So the advice is understand what the market's doing right now in terms of how much money to raise and then what your valuations could be. And number two, when you're making the pitch, have a good case for why you're asking for that amount of money. You want to be able to convince the investor with that amount of money, you'll be able to reach the next stage of milestones in your business and likely pursue a next financing round. Okay, just as a reminder, in the comment section, please do ask some questions. It'll make it more fun as we go through this conversation. Okay, next up, organize your campaign. I meet many founders who approach their sales process for their own company with great rigor and discipline. But oddly, when it turns to how organized they are with raising investor capital, I ask them, how's the round going? And they say things like, well, had some great conversations, been encouraging feedback. So I ask them that question maybe a month or two months later, and they probably say the same thing. To me, that's an indicator that they haven't been very organized with running after that campaign. I strongly encourage founders to do something like this. This is the actual sheet that I used 
for my 2015 equity round for my company, ABLE. This is running a regular Salesforce-like pipeline model where we say, who's on the wait list? Who do we need to schedule a meeting with? Did we schedule the meeting? Have we met them? Are we in diligence? Are we into round two? Do we have an offer on the table? This is the kind of discipline many people bring to the sales process. I say bring this to your fundraising process. You begin with that list of 100 investors. You want to move to your list of the actual prospects you want to pitch. You want to organize them in a CRM tool like this or even a well-organized Excel document. Then have templates that make it easy for you to run a real campaign. Just some quick numbers. We're actually pretty good at fundraising, but for our last deal, we began with a list of over 100 people that we wanted to pitch. We started with 100. We narrowed that list down and we asked 50 people if we could pitch our idea to them. We then got about 45 meetings. We did about 16 follow-up meetings. We had two term sheet offers and we closed one. So I wrote the dang book on the thing and I closed 2% of the target. So if you haven't written the book, and I'm sure you're a great fundraiser, but my argument is maybe you're going to be better than me, maybe you're double, maybe you're five times better, that's still a 10% close rate. So you've got to have a lot of new people at the top of the pipeline when you're out raising capital. All right, that's organizing the campaign. Generating momentum. So you've got all your prospects laid out in a CRM tool, and you're out there saying, I'm asking all these people for meetings. That their common response to me is, well, you know, that's really a neat idea. You know, just let me know how the round's going and I'll get back to you. That's the beginning of what we call the long no. The long no is one of the worst things to get as a founder. Because think about it, there's two ways. You can have a short or long answer. You can have a yes or a no. And what most investors do is they kind of plan to say no, but they don't want to be mean up front. So they say something like, oh, so excited about what you're doing. Let me know how it's going and come back and report to me. Red alert, red alert. That's the beginning of your long no. You've got to get out of the long no. I'd encourage you to try to get to a quick yes. That's an obvious answer. Of course, you want them to say yes right then. But it's actually really valuable to aim for a quick no. Try to ferret out and learn quickly. Are they likely to say no? Because it'll help you figure out which people to really focus on. So how do you get to that quick yes? Quick story for you. So a lot of people believe when they get in a meeting with an investor deck, I'm here and I'm going to assault you with all my right reasons that this business model is just killer. Well, you might imagine that's not a great strategy. Evan Loomis, my co-author, walks into this meeting to pitch a billionaire for his company. He's in this amazing private office in New York City. And it's a huge